What's going on, Flood Nation, and welcome back. Today, we have an amazing conversation with an individual named Alex Shin. He's a former founder of Hashed, which was one of the leading crypto VCs in South Korea, and really was on the forefront of the explosion of cryptocurrency in South Korea. He's now working with Michael Arrington, who's the former founder of TechCrunch and Crunchbase at XRP Arrington Capital as a venture partner. He is a brilliant individual, and even more importantly, an all-around great guy. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. We actually filmed this episode several weeks ago and in this conversation Alex predicts what he calls the halo pump where there would be one explosive pump upwards on the Bitcoin price before returning back to a bearish posturing and that is exactly what happened so keep your eyes and ears out for that moment where he predicts that and I hope you guys enjoy what I found to be an extremely educational and insightful conversation here on FUD TV. Welcome to FUD TV. Alex Shin a former founder of the Hashed Venture Capital Organization, one of the largest crypto investment funds in Korea, and now a venture partner at Arrington XRP Capital. Welcome to FUD TV. Hey, hey, thanks for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. So please, just so that the audience knows a little bit about you, could you talk about your history as an entrepreneur and how you got into this wild world of cryptocurrency and blockchain? Oh, some of that background stuff. Let's see. Um, left college, got into... SaaS and an enterprise companies. Um, I, I worked at DocuSign of all places. I was an early employee there. That thing took off and I was like, wow, I guess all startups are like this. Uh, I moved down to the Bay Area. Uh, I was working on the Google Earth, Google Maps team for a while. Uh, learned a lot of great things, met a lot of mentors, left, did some biotech. Um, actually, I worked at uh, Council. So if you guys know Bology, who used to be the CTO of Coinbase, that was the, the biotech company he co-founded with his brother Ramji. So uh, that's sort of where I got my first whiff of Bitcoin. Um, like he was running around the lab, like telling everybody, put 10% of your net worth in Bitcoin. And we're like, dude, we're biotech. What are you talking about? Uh, so that was that. And then, and then I-, I And what year I, was that? 2015, 14? 2014, 13? an auspicious and interesting time to be joining the crypto movement as things are tanking, right? Uh, well, I mean, I, I was looking at it. I didn't have any, I didn't have real money to buy anything. Oh, God, it's really hard to use back in the day. People were mm -hmm. trying to mine this on their like work computers at Google. Regardless, the, the big change for me was I, I launched a, an anonymous community app called Blind. It's doing quite well. Uh, it's like Reddit meets Glassdoor on crack. It's all your, <laughs> no, no, it's like it's like all your Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon employees that are work email verified are talking to each other. This community app, uh, and that got me really plugged into kind of the Korean tech community and entrepreneurial community, all this good stuff. Right, the app is still doing great. Uh, and then it wasn't until early 2017 where I met Simon from Hashed. He's he's the founder and CEO now. Uh, like years ago, he crashed on this couch right behind me, and that's how I met him. Right. <laughs> years ago, years ago, before he was a crypto god. Uh, and then I learned about <laughs> blockchain Ethereum. And I thought it was kind of cute and interesting and novel at the time. The typical tech guy, like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Decentralization, that sounds, that makes sense, great. Democracy <laughs> of data, yay, right? But I was sitting at a Phil's coffee uh, down the street from my house, and people I didn't know were coming up to me and asking me about crypto and Korea. Uh, all the VCs I knew were calling me early 2017, you know, and like right before Kimchi Premium started taking off. And I thought it was a sign. I was like, wow, that's interesting. No one's ever asked me about Korean anything ever, right? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, saw a rare opportunity for East Asia to be relevant in this new category. I, I hooked up with a bunch of friends who were, happened to be in crypto. We put 99.8% of our net worth into a syndicate and we eventually formed that into a fund and a group and an organization. So you created so you created a hit app within the the techie community, essentially for employees of the biggest tech firms. Is is that yeah? And yeah, and so some of your listeners listeners might know, but if you work in tech, you've probably heard about it. Uh, it's a, it's a very niche app, right? Uh, but you have to work verify in, and then there's a private channel for you and your coworkers, which is the really juicy stuff. And it's wow. like this intercompany channel where you can see Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and Amazon people chatting with each other about salaries and rumors or whatever you want, right? Wow, so you yeah. can you can just get in there and you can see all, all the gossip all anonymously and, and really <laughs> kind of get a sense of what's going on. Hey, man, I got a lot of friends who, who are like interviewing at, you know, Google, and they want to know what the interview process is like, and they want to know what the comp package, but I don't want salary data from six months ago. I want salary data from six hours ago, but you can wow. just tag somebody at Google and ask a question. So it's it's been slow and steady, but the app's done quite well. I have a lot of friends who reached out to me 
I used to wear a blind hoodie in the elevator and people were like, dude, I'm on your app. <laughs> they were, they were real sly about it. So, but you know, I, I really understood the power of voice and privacy and anonymity yep. while building that because building on anonymous communities is really, really difficult. It's tricky, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think so I think you see the connections right there between you know the the sort of crypto movement, which mm-hmm. you know isn't all about privacy, but there's a a big concern with privacy and a big understanding of, of privacy uh, and awareness that you see uh, more in the crypto community than outside. So yeah. you t- so you take a, a successful run as an entrepreneur, which you told me a little bit about previously. You were growth hacking. You were putting up posters on the campus of Facebook and yeah. and yeah. and Amazon, doing what you needed to do to get that kind of uh, a, a business started. And then you take your success and you put 98% of it in, into crypto. Tell me about that decision. You know, what year was it? What month was it? Let's get a sense of where in the, where in the world crypto so was. So and- mid, mid to late 2017, like I was dabbling gotcha. in. Uh, but, you know, I was also in America. So mm-hmm. like when we went all in, it was like $5,000 in Coinbase. And I was like, what the hell is this? Whereas mm-hmm. in, in Korea, the reason why crypto took off is, if you don't know, um, there was a big peaceful rally where the South Korean people overthrew the government. Like, Two million people showed up with candles and was like, get out, get out the office late. Uh, but in doing so, no one was home to put really basic guidelines in place. Yep. So no AMLs, no KYCs, nothing for crypto, right? Crypto assets is still not an asset class in South Korea. So naturally, in a country as homogenous and hyper-connected as South Korea, this shit takes off, right? So yep. a lot of my friends put in, you know, multiple hundreds of K into crypto right out of the gates. And it just took me a little longer to get into the groove. Um, but I figured the logic, you know, like I'm in the Bay Area, I have a decent career track. The worst that can happen to me is middle class, right? And it's, I don't have that many years uh, before someone or something becomes more important to me than me. So, you know, why don't I maximize my risks, uh, risk, risk exposure and, you know, also have skin in the game, right? Like if I really care about something, you got to put your money where your mouth is. So that ended up being a cool decision. Well, I, at least I until absolutely. early 2018. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you you had six months of being the smartest man in the room. Um, yeah, but yeah, and then you know. Yeah, the uh, so I mean, how does your journey then, as as an entrepreneur, obviously you're you're investing your your own money, which for fund managers, the audience, if you're not used to this, it's very much so irregular for a fund manager to be investing with all personal capital. Yeah. Um, and how do you think that you were different than other pro- projects? Like, how did you view entrepreneurship? and projects with the lens well, that you're coming from. The, and you know, I don't want to speak on behalf of all my brothers at Hashed, but the beautiful thing about us is I didn't think we had any preconceived biases of being a fund manager or like an asset manager or understanding risk mitigation. We're all entrepreneurs. And with the exception of me, everybody came from sort of engineering backgrounds, right? So it's just our, our risk tolerance was insanely high. And we were all at our core very passionate. We saw an opportunity for Korea and Korean entrepreneurs and Korean technology and Korean ecosystem to really pick up on this. You know, if you look at frontier tech, AI and open machine learning, computer vision, sort of all roads lead to Google, Facebook, Amazon, IBM, Microsoft, et cetera, right? Mm-hmm. It's just a category that they've over allocated into. But you know, with crypto native, digital native mediums, I just feel like Korea, Japan, China has a real shot at this. They just get this kind of stuff. Like 55% of game out of marketplaces is South Korea, right? Yep. Like we got digital celebrities running around, right? So I, I think so. Like there's some opportunities there. So I think South Korea was the first country to adopt or use digital assets in 1999, SciWorld. That I've met the founder of SciWorld as well. So yeah, there's a lot of gaming movement out there, right? There's, there's interesting experiments you can run. I feel like crypto is early. But there's really unique stuff you can do in really homogenous kind of digital native friendly markets like Korea, Japan, that you just can't do in the Bay, right? So what do you think would be a good example of those types of projects that you see thriving in a Korea, but potentially struggling to catch uh, the proper adoption here in the United States? Well, there's a lot of moving parts like, and you know, and prior to crypto, I didn't travel the world, so I didn't really know. But my thing was, okay, like, I'm not going to understand consensus mechanisms and mechanism design like the rest of my Bay Area peers. So what can I do to really move the ecosystem forward? How about I travel to all the hotspots back to back to back, right? Are you still there? Yeah, still I am. You're, you're, uh, your video froze. Oh, there you go. You're back. You're okay, back. good. We're back. All right. <laughs> all right. So my thing was, like, where can I add value to the ecospace? I'm not really super mega technical, right? Um, so I just flew to all the hotspots back to back for about two years. Um, I did 173,000 miles wow. in a year, in one year. And I was, you know, home, this home for 18 days in 2018. All wow. kinds of negative decisions. Yeah, I know. I was still paying rent. <laughs> uh, 
Well, cool it was okay because crypto yeah. was booming, right? <laughs> it was, it was. And like every, every region I went to, just, they just had a really different outlook on what this was because people were trying to figure this out, right? And, you know, the Bay Area is wonderful for a few things, but it's also sort of an echo chamber in some sense, right? So, you know, the crypto ethos that we understand here, like the OG Bitcoin friends that I have, they got in like sub $1, the way they view crypto is a little bit different than, you know, what Korea, Japan, like freaking Singapore, Dubai, you know, Shanghai, they all view this thing as, right? Would you, would you say that the Bay Area view of it, um, you, I would imagine that in the Bay Area, they view decentralization not necessarily as positively as the early adopters because, you know, the Bay Area is built on big centralized sort of entities. I don't know, is that, is that wrong? No, no, I, I think, I think, you know, the Bay is basically, and this is just my opinion, and I'm generalizing a bit, if you, if you like, condense it down to the core things that it's really good at, I think it's phenomenal at product market fit. Mm -hmm. It's just this sheer harmony of like venture money, and sheer number of engineers. Yeah, might be why like the last five major tech innovations in the world, I wouldn't say we're minted here, but we're definitely globalized here, you know, social, cloud, mobile, all this good jazz, right? Yep. Uh, but the really exciting thing is, is like, like you go to Vietnam and it's like this inverse pyramid population of young people and everybody's like 20, right? And they graduate college and they don't know what cloud is. They don't know mobile. The first thing they see is machine learning and crypto, right? Yep. So, you know, they're looking at this from a very fresh lens, right? And they have new tools like Slack and Zoom to really kind of plug into today's ecosystem. Um, like South Korea is very homogenous and people there, like they speculate, right? It's like, like we're like fourth of the volume of, of all of BitMEX, right? It's totally different, right? So in the Bay, we're like, ah, oh, Asia is just speculation volume. In Asia, you know, you know, speculation is a form of trust and understanding mm -hmm. how to harness that and leverage that makes a lot more sense, right? Uh, the SEC has got really, really long arms and very long reach. You know, the rules in Asia are a little bit different. It's kind of like these three things are legal. Everything else, I don't know. You got to do it and we'll, we'll tell you if it's not working, right? So it's kind of this shoot first and ask questions later mentality that I think is sort of what you need, my personal opinion, is what, sort of what you need to push the ecosystem forward. Yeah, I mean, you look at all the, the great innovations are pushed forward by people, you know, asking uh, instead for forgiveness in, in, in case they did do something that was against the rules. I mean, how many times have we seen Mark Zuckerberg go and apologize in front of uh, Congress uh, for things yeah, that yeah. they didn't even know they could put rules on because it hadn't happened yet? There wasn't an ecosystem that could jeopardize these cert these certain liberties. So how could we have put a rule on that? Now we just have a, a guy who's apologizing, but he's apologizing for dominating um, really communications in the modern age and and it's well a, yeah but this, we don't want to get into zuck and facebook and everything else that's sort of on that all right i'll scratch that. the libra questions off the list no no right. we can we can talk about it but i just there, there's a lot there's a lot of moving parts about this yeah and the bay i wouldn't say the centralized entities i think that guys here get the crypto ethos because they've seen what google facebook and everybody do right they, yeah. they show up and they're like yeah democratization of data, decentralization, trust, censorship resistance, like they get that. You go to Asia and you're like censorship resistance and they're like, what? Yeah. Like, <laughs> over here, we look at China, we're like, the guys are crazy. The government's controlling you. You go there, most people are okay with it, right? Yeah. If you're not, maybe you move to Hong Kong. Actually, maybe not now, but. Maybe, maybe not now, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I think that's yeah, a good point. Different. It's yeah. di different views of, of what is a necessary freedom to be happy and um, mm -hmm. you know, different la layers of trust. Uh, I remember you, uh, spoken previously about how trust is really brand oriented in mm -hmm. uh, the Asian markets. And I think it's true, you know, globally, we, we tend to trust brands. But um, the difference between seeing a Bitcoin, which, you know, is hailed, especially by early adopters as the most trustworthy versus like you were saying, when line comes out with a crypto integration, now that's more trustworthy, because that's a recognizable name. In, in a market like Korea or Japan rather? Well, I mean, like these are countries that are also built on conglomerates. Like they have mega corporations that span generations like Mitsubishi, Yamaha. Samsung's like 20% of Korea GDP. You, you know, they're pretty much the government in many ways, right? And wow. There's a, there's a lot of adjacency in, in, in both, both governing powers to just make sure that they stay where they are today. Because if Samsung tumbles, you know, the rest of the Korean economy goes bye-bye as well, right? And these are not the cases here in the US, right? It's more yep. of a free market, right? or at least appears to be free market. So yeah, definitely different ideologies. Um, the really cool part is, not the cool part, but people in Asia are, in my opinion, are a little less sensitive to price volatility. So they're willing to try new things. They look at crypto, crypto as a blockchain technology or whatever you want to call it, as this new medium where they can potentially make some money or try some new stuff that they previously couldn't do. Whereas over here, it's like the whole narrative is around trust and decentralization. So I feel like in the Bay, you know, we look at if, if we condense blockchain crypto all down to one word, which is trust, 
That's why we try to use these damn things that don't scale and slow and expensive. Uh, in the Bay, it's like we build trust from the bottom up. So we theory them up. And then everybody gets mad about EOS and Tron and all these other things. They're too centralized, right? And then you go to Asia, because that ethos is a little bit different, they're more like, hey, let's give these people something they can play with because they don't actually care about super decentralization. Then naturally that leads to like, you know, all of US talking about DeFi all day, right? Because DeFi only works when it's super decentralized. What are you, you can't build DeFi on Tron, right? No. You know, but Asians don't have patience for that. Like we're not gonna wait five minutes for one of my characters to swing a sword in a video game. No. But I will wait five minutes for a mortgage loan, mortgage loan, right? So yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. So it's yeah. different ideologies. It's interesting to see the market diverge. Yeah, it's in it's interesting, and it's certainly a question. I was listening to a podcast by someone named Travis Kling, who you may or may not have interacted with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A fun Ikagi. called Iki Ikigai or Ikigai. Ikigai yes. Yeah, yeah, something like that. And uh, he essentially was saying, you know, one of the questions that you have to ask is how decentralized should this be? And you know, if you're asking for something like digital gold or decentralized financial, you know, loans and stuff like that, well, you'd want it really decentralized. And then if you're mm. asking for how decentralized you need it to be if you're if you're gaming and you need extremely mm. quick response times, you know, how how decentralized should that be? Um, I want to talk a little bit about your experience at Hash, some of the deals you saw, some some yeah. successes and failures. What were some of the best deals you saw and what made them good deals? I don't know. So the term best deal, it means a broad range of things, mm -hmm. right? You know, we were sitting in Korea, so things are a little bit different out there. Uh, at least now that I'm learning a bit more just about investing in general and capital markets and trading live assets. Like back then, you know, we were trying to just build the hub. Like we, we just wanted a reason for entrepreneurs and guys like Vitalik and CZ to, to, to frequent Korea. Like Elon and Zuck are never going to come to Korea, but in crypto, these guys do. So, you know, I think I'm just trying to go back to like the root story. It's um, mid-2017, late-2017, we only had... Um, speculation volume and nothing else and for this ecosystem to thrive we assumed that we needed a good projects and we needed developer ecosystems and we you know did a bunch of events and incubated a bunch of companies right um, one of them that hash got involved really early on was icon mm -hmm. and icon freaking just blew up it probably just timing wise just the narrative wise it was just good timing on that part um, another one is we evangelized a lot of these projects right and i, I say we but it was mostly simon because, uh, you know, he was really well plugged into the Korean tech ecosystem. Um, Terra was another one, just a stablecoin project. So he knew Dan and met up with them and talked about crypto. And they wanted to do like an e-commerce coin. But at the time, uh, you know, like price volatility was never going to make that happen. He's like, well, why don't I print or make a stablecoin? So that ended up being a super awesome deal. Um, Polychain was involved. Arrington was involved. And that ended up going really well. Um, I happen to know the chairman of Kakao. Uh, Kakao is like the largest messaging app, Uber app, Spotify app of Korea uh, through, a mute, through a friend who was working right under him. So he called us in to meet and I brought Simon uh, and the two of us kind of pitched this crypto idea. And I, you know, I figured that a few months later that birthed um, Clayton, which is Kakao's kind of blockchain arm. So, and you know, they're, they're just at the cusp of launching. So we'll see how that goes. And their whole strategy is distribution. It's like, great, mm -hmm. like infrastructure tools. Um, but you know, maybe we think, Infrastructure and tools actually follow users, right? Yep. It's kind of like in the Bay, everybody's building all these really cool tools, but you know, we're building the app store without Apple, without the phone, right? So we'll see yeah. how that goes. In Asia, you don't really have open source communities. That's like a really foreign concept to them. So showing code on GitHub and communicating mm -hmm. to your audience, like that's a really a, like foreign concept. So I think that's one of the reasons why they got a lot of issues earlier on, right? Yeah. A lot, a lot, a lot of the U.S. investors were like, "What's going on?" And they're mm -hmm. like, "Dude, we're building." It's like, "Why don't you open source everything?" I'm like, "Why should we?" Right? So, <laughs> yeah, there was some uh, cultural divide there for sure. Yeah, and 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 there's still push and pull, I think, uh, about open sourcing uh, in general because mm -hmm. you know it's it, when you're building something and you're putting so much uh, innovation into it uh, and brilliance into it, and then for example, like Ethereum, and then you open source and all of a sudden there's 17 forks because people can easily just sort of take your what you've built and kind of create their own uh, flavor on it and uh, do it very quickly. Um, it's kind of, uh, it's an interesting, obviously I, I believe in open source, but it's definitely, there's some tension there. What would you say yeah. is your is the biggest lessons you've learned from your days at Hashed? Oh, I don't know. Well, I mean, a lot because I've I've only been on the operator like scrappy entrepreneur side of things and 
the way I viewed a venture capital and a fundraise was completely changed now that I'm sort of on the other side of the fence, right? I'm learning, I'm trying to be a pseudo VC. Um, I learned that different markets are very, very different. Like I went to Shanghai and I realized I couldn't get a cab. Like I look like them, but I don't speak Mandarin. So I'm never going to be able to operate in China. It was really clear. You know, I went to Dubai and I realized that these guys operate their freaking country like a startup. They're incredibly savvy and super smart, right? Like, oh, we need a chief of police. And they just like poached a chief of police from London. And, oh, we need a chief economist. They poached one. From <laughs> that sounds very Bay Area to me. Right. So I, I've learned a lot um, and I've learned to appreciate the different ideas in different markets. And I think the exciting thing about blockchain is like all of the markets are trying to steal some of that Silicon Valley thunder. Mm -hmm. Right. Like everybody was a little late for the venture game. Like venture here is like 60 years old. Venture elsewhere is like 10, 15. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're trying to artificially like blow up this ecosystem. Whereas crypto as a category is kind of happening everywhere. So that's I learned a lot of that as well. Um, what, what else? I was going to say something that's pretty relevant. Also, I learned a lot about um, what happens when, when you launch a coin. And one of the reasons, was, why aren't these things working? Like on paper, it sounds really like, oh, this could be really beautiful. Oh, protocol ecosystems. Yay, token models. But then none of this ever works, right? And we, we like largely categorize it as like, oh, UX, right? Oh, uh, mechanism design, right? That doesn't work, right? Oh, custody, uh, infrastructure, like, but that means a lot of things. Yeah. But I think pe people forget, like, when sometimes, like, for example, the, if the market is too hot, and a project launches a coin, and it happens to be like an ERC twenty standard, and some exchange just lists it without talking to you, and then someone else market makes it, and the price starts going crazy. Like, imagine what that does to a team. You know, like I've seen a lot of me being an investor and founder and me also being like an advisor and friends to a lot of these founders. Like I've seen com like teams that are actually focused on building something completely get derailed, right? Because suddenly Too much they money. have millions. Well, I mean, it perceived money because it's all locked yeah. up or something. Uh, and then like, what does that do? Maybe the founders are still focused. Maybe one guy wants to check out a little bit. They need a little exit. They want to take a little off the table. Like that incentive engine completely changes. And then from the outside, just as investors, you don't know what that feels like try to hire somebody and your interns are worth a million dollars already like, what do you, <laughs> how do you, yeah so there's a lot of weird things that happen in crypto and i think you know people throw the word scam around like it's nothing right and most of the people who do aren't operators that have ever, ever ran a company before like they yes. don't know what that sentiment is like at all so you know I, I i like the fact that the market's cooling down a little and a lot of people are focused on like real stuff right yeah, I think, you know, I, as a YouTuber, I hear the word scam all the time, right? This is a scam. Tron's a scam, right? That's the biggest one. Tron's a scam. Uh, uh, so many things are a scam. A, a scam is when there is no actual thing and they just yeah. take your money. The scam is when there's, it's, you know, not when uh, they misrepresent a partnership. That's a bad, that's bad move from a PR standpoint, dishonest. But Tron is still a blockchain, still works. You know, it's... Uh, and so, you know, it is, it is frustrating because building technology is really hard and people have to dedicate all of themselves to it for many years to, to really accomplish things. And uh, so it is, it is pretty damning when the label scam just gets thrown around because there are people who are, who are really dedicated trying to bring these technologies to life and, and make them popular. And then, you know, you have sort of an uneducated tech audience. Uh, a, a lot of the times people who came to crypto for money for, for the gains and then have a, have a slight dictionary they've developed of buzzwords. Uh, and then, you know, they, they sort of parlay that into understanding what dev cycles are like, which is, you know, it's, it's its own beast. So it's, it's part of the step. It's part of the step. And, you know, we as investors, like I remember early days of crypto, like there's no contracts, like there's a cat icon on, on telegram and he gives me an address and we send a million dollars. That was, that was, that, no, that was, that. That was, yes, we did. That's like, that's the early days of ICOs, right? Because it was supposed to be like a pure decentralized community effort thing. And then, you know, and then people wanted a bit more protection, right? Yeah, of course. Like, it's just natural. And now everybody's doing equity deals because investors, and there's a lot of them in the bank, want, you know, board seats and rights and all this good stuff, right? Yep. So, yeah. Well, I think it's, you know, it's also one of those things where, you know, I believe that people don't necessarily want all that responsibility. When it comes to if you have your life's net worth, you know, in Bitcoin, or uh, let's just say you're an early adopter and, and you get, you know, 100 to 1,000 times your money back on, on this one investment, 
you might want some kind of insurance security and you might not want to be the person directly charged with protecting it. You might want a bank like entity to protect your funds. And I think that most people will not want to be the possessors of their own keys, even if Bitcoin does go completely viral and takes over gold and other forms of currency. Um, I think that people will desire some kind of uh, crypto bank. What do you think about that? Well, yeah, I, that, that's always going to exist. It's like, yeah. and I think there's going to be like a middle step in almost any big change that ever comes. It's kind of like, like I don't know, like Yahoo and AOL are fairly irrelevant today, but without them, we probably would never have Google, Facebook. Correct. Right? Like, you know, we look back and it's easier to like digest why these things were so significant, like PayPal. Wow. Right? Mm -hmm. Imagine the trusts that they built for inter internet, right? eBay, like, oh, trading. Not really. It's like the five star rating system that's like ubiquitous. Right, across every platform. They're the ones that pioneered that. So I think we'll see it. Like when I talk to Novo, that's what he's trying to build. Yeah. He sees all this institutional money pent up and he was like pseudo retired and he got into the space and he's like, you know, for the first time in my career, I feel like I can build something on my own and I'm really excited. And I was like, you know, that's really cool. But he realizes there needs to be a brand that people can trust to get, get to just get their feet wet. Right. Before we ever reach a world where like truly decentralized and internet has their internet native money, right? And and is he when he says brand, does he believe that Bitcoin is that brand? Because it feels as as though he's he's you know pretty securely focused. Although Galaxy does investments all over, uh, yeah. is is Bitcoin the brand, or do we need something a little bit more relatable uh, to get more mainstream users into this entire sort of world? You know, is we have plumbing, we have electrical grids. Uh, what are the what are the coffee shops and the nightclubs that get people in? You know, and it depends on the sector, right? Because New York and the Bay are very, very different. They're almost like different countries. And you go to Berlin, there's a very different action there as well, right? So when you talk to somebody at Galaxy or you're like in a big financial organization uh, as their background, like their idea of general consumers is a bunch of other bankers and financial, you know, institutional <laughs> money. You know, my idea of consumers is like my mom and dad, right? Like they're mm -hmm. in South Korea, like my, my grandma can't read. Like, you know, what, what kind of utility can they get out of it? Yep. So every every region is trying to like pop open a door, right? And for, for institutional money to come in, they need to be able to trust. They need like a Goldman in the space. They need a Bloomberg to, to look stuff up. And there's a lot of people working on those categories, right? Yeah. And and for the Bay, it's like, you know, the developers need to be able to trust these tools. And now we got Uniswap and we got all this DeFi compound maker. People actually trust these brands, right? Mm -hmm. But they're still like a decentralized team. So yeah. And in Asia, we have the Kakao, the lines, and we'll see what Telegram does, right? So the, yeah, everybody's going after it. It's it's moving in the direction that it's supposed to be, right? And uh, you know, I, I I think that's really really a good way to understand is that in such a diverse movement where it's a global movement, everyone has their own ideas of what the yeah. movement even is. You know, people. Yeah. You ask someone what Bitcoin is in you know San Francisco versus Vietnam versus you know at different parts of the world, you're going to get different answers. Um, even if you ask two people sitting at the same table in San Francisco, you might get different answers. Yeah, I think the way I, I'm, I've, the, the crazy thing is, is I started crypto, Ethereum, and beyond. And that might be because my, my circle was Korean. And Korea wasn't really online for Bitcoin, right? Like China, Japan was. That's why you have such big trading volumes there. But South Korea at its peak was like XRP, Bitcoin, I mean, Ethereum and everything else, right? All, all the secondaries, all the alts, right? So, and I've sort of dialed back, you know, you go back and read, read the Bitcoin standard and you start talking to a lot of Bitcoin OGs and like, okay, like I see the significance of this. And a friend of mine, Lily Liu, who used to be a CFO at uh, Earn.com, she coined this Bitcoin rationalist term. So I'm like, you know, I sort of subscribe to that. Like that makes sense to me, right? Uh, you're not, know, you're not like, a maximalist. You you have you have logic. So <laughs> no, I get I, I get the significance of it. Yeah. Right. And then uh, another friend of mine, Hasib, I think, who spoke on a podcast somewhere. He was talking about like the Bitcoin narrative archaeology, which is incredibly important if you think about it. Right. A lot of people entering crypto space today weren't around for 15, 2013, 16. Like store of value. No one really talked about Bitcoin as store of value before 2016. Yeah. Right. And is is the narrative following price or is price following narrative? Hmm. Right. Yeah, you know, it's 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 easy to look back and explain things. Um, yeah. It's it's a lot harder <laughs> to look forward, but I, but I think you're you're absolutely right that, especially through bear markets, extended bear markets, one could argue that right now it looks like we could be entering into some kind of weird secondary bear market. Um, certainly hope that it's not, but you know the charts, uh, as far as I you know I've checked, uh, don't look all that bullish right now. Um, 
this kind of extended, you know, uh, I guess a downward trend or, you know, there was a great uh, period in early 2019. Um, but I feel like still there was so much doubt in the community. Like, is this, are we back to bull running? And is it even right to be bull running like the way that 2017 was where things were just, you could throw a, throw a dart at it and you would end up making money. Um, and then, you know, what kinds of innovations are going to come out of this? People working through the the bear market who aren't here for the hype. Um, I think I'm really excited, but of course there was a big hangover from the 2017 ICO era where there was so many promises and so little uh, felt like came out of it. Um, how do you now approach sort of your role as an investor in the space, given how, how many projects have come out and how few projects have been able to achieve their goals? You know, I, I've sort of been on the inside circle, right? So I have the privilege of knowing a lot of the key players or having had met some of them, right? And there's a lot of disagreements in that front. And, you know, a lot of the founders have very different ideas. And there's a lot of stuff that's going on in the back end. And just reading the blogs and the, you know, the, the press isn't really going to get you a lot of the truth, right? Uh, there's definitely bad actors in the space that left a sour taste in the ecosystem. And in many ways, a lot of kind of ICO projects of yesteryears from 2017, early 2018 are, are still cranking away, still shipping, hitting milestones. They're just not getting a lot of the mind share, right? It's like the same 20,000 people in crypto who are looking for a shiny new thing it's because everyone is so short-term oriented and opportunistic. That's how they got into the space to begin with, right? And it's going to take more time for them to realize this is a long-term thing and investing is not a short-term 2x money. It's not. Nope. It's not sustainable, right? Uh, nothing, no, nothing ever lasts like that. But when people are looking at the market today, they look at Bitcoin, they're like, can I, can I freaking 100x leverage on BitMEX and make, make that kind of money? It's like, I don't know. I, I think that's part of the problem and why people keep viewing this space as, as bull bear market. I mean, Bitcoin freaking 2x this year. Like that's, mm -hmm. what asset class does that, right? So <laughs> true. Like realistically, true. realistically, right? And you know, when, when I was at Hash, the numbers we were posting was insane. It made no sense to anybody, right? Because we were also in Korea. Yep. So I'm learning a lot more about that. And for those of you on this channel, like, you know, investing, I'm not like, I'm a pseudo VC at best. I've been doing this two years. I'm learning, right? Uh, investing is, I don't know, in my perspective, it's, I, I try to be authentic to, to what I know and what I'm good at, right? There's no one kind of cookie cutter strategy. Um, uh, you know, my thing is, is I'm a relationships guy. So, you know, to me, it's, it's a relationship between partner and entrepreneur. And together we can build something. Hopefully it'll capture value. Uh, I do keep an open mind on where value is captured in crypto. <clears throat> it might not be Bitcoin. It might not be tokens. It might legit be like a sword in a game somewhere. <laughs> that like a thousand hundred X's. Who knows? Right. Which, which will happen. Um, which probably, yeah, yeah. We, we don't Probably know, has right? happened already. <laughs> right. And like, I don't know what kind of vehicle you need to get ahead of that. Right. Well, what yeah. I hope is this public fundraising does become a thing. Uh, does become socialized and more accepted. And I hope that, you know, you know, five years time, 10 years time, Gen Z and young people can invest, you know, $10 in some sneaker that, you know, this is making and they 100x their money, right? And, and it's not even about the money. That just becomes more gamified and socially accepted, right? Like people understand more about just investing in general and that becomes a little bit more diversified. That's what yeah. I'm hoping for. You know, I, I was never particularly uh, interested in investing in the stock market. I, I did yeah. a little bit, but, you know, there was always the perception that it's so that, that you are getting the sucker price in the stock market, that there's these backroom deals that are happening before you get to them. You don't feel like you're getting something, an authentic look at an investment. And there was something so raw about crypto that you really felt like you were at the, the ground level, you know, in an yeah. ICO, what, what's earlier than an ICO, you know? And so you just sort of really, obviously there was pre-sales and all these other rounds that they were able to do. And so, yeah, in a lot of ICOs, there were sort of earlier rounds than you, but for the most part, I think it gets a whole new energy on speculation. Do you think speculation is a healthy practice? Do you think like people should be uh, engaged in speculation to some degree within, you know, does that make them more financially aware, more financially involved? Well, you know, this might be like a really unpopular opinion, but the only utility so far in crypto, for the most part, and I'm generalizing a bit, was mm -hmm. speculation. Yep. Right. And, uh, and operating in Asia, like I've sort of seen a lot of how the underbelly of the system works, right? And it's a little crazy out there, right? Stuff that we, you know, we wouldn't even imagine, right? A lot of Bitcoin volume is, uh, bit, and, you know, God bless the bit white boys, right? <laughs> but I think, I, I think there's still a lot of like random movements that are really someone's controlling out there, right? 
you have not as decentralized as people think. So yeah, no speculation is important. It brings a lot of awareness and people get burned and they realize that you can't trust everything that's written on the internet and then people get better from it. It happens in every category, every time there's a new movement, right? Just the difference that I'm seeing now is like mature financial markets like America, Europe, like Hong Kong. Usually, you know, the regulators are really quick and they, you know, they're like, they hand out subpoenas like hotcakes and they quickly get ahead of this curve. Whenever there's like a new paradigm shift and people are printing money, right? Um, so a lot of the retail investors in the U.S. were protected. Uh, but then in Asia, I don't know, the regulators aren't as fast or they're involved in it or it's just a little bit different. And, uh, I, I know a lot of retail investors are really, really hurt about this crypto thing. And people forget that like in South Korea, like Ethereum all-time high was 21.49 or something because we had that kimchi premium. And that that 86% drawdown actually was 96 in Korea, right? So Ouch. The order of Same with Ripple. I mean, Ripple was ball. Ripple was the big one that uh, uh, Korea was loving. As I remember, Ripple was like five dollars or something in in Korea. Yeah. At that point. Uh, it, we, I think we were like seventy seven percent of Ripple retail volume globally in South Korea alone, which is and crazy. There's a lot of weird things that happen in crypto land uh, in Asia. It's definitely cooling down a little bit. Um, you know, when, when I when I hang out in New York and I meet a lot of the institutional guys, like I realize the way that they see this category, like it's still kind of a baby to them. Like mm -hmm. the really smart money managers are looking at this, like there's not enough liquidity for them to play around, right? But when they do start coming in, the markets will mature, it'll balance out a little bit, right? Even now it's a lot better. Like you don't see 40, 50% movement, right? No. Yeah, 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 exactly. So do, do you, uh, so if you don't mind me asking, are right. you a, a holder of many altcoins? Um, not really. Maybe, maybe indirectly. Um, I might be holding a few. Yeah. I don't actually manage my own stuff because I keep getting hacked. So. Oh, really? Yeah. I keep getting SIM swapped. So fuck you, at and <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, man. You guys are just horrendous. I is that a good... credit, like. Oh, to be fair though, at and is actually sponsoring this episode. So we actually have to, <laughs> we have to run a quick ad really quick. Sorry. <laughs> No, like I, you know, I called them once. Every time I'm in Asia, my my LT disappears, and I'm like, no, nope, I know what's happening. And it's just annoying. Got to go change my emails and da, da 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 da. There's nothing to take, right? I just like I can't make my next meeting. I can't call Uber, right? Wow. Yeah, it's horrendous. Wow, that is horrible. And I call like the security team, and they're like offline until 8 a.m. Eastern time. I'm like, God damn, I gotta wait all night. And at 3 a.m. my time in Hong Kong, I call them, and they're like, dude, like somebody walked into a store in Florida with an ID with your name, but their photo on it. I was like, wow, that's really elaborate, right? So yeah. I get it. Yeah, that's it's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, it happened, I, it happened to three of my friends at the same time. Well, yeah, you, you, you know, I worry about the same thing as a crypto YouTuber, but just everyone knows that my private keys are on a, a piece of metal next to the center of the earth where I buried them. So <laughs> sim swapping me is is a useless useless exercise. Um, okay, yeah. so not a lot of altcoins. Do you still not hold some Bitcoin? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Indirectly, of course. Indirectly. Uh, and, and of course, it's also because I'm American and, and at Hashed, I'm the only American founder on the team. So I don't have any, I don't have like a Binance account. I don't have, and I'm like horrible at trading. Like you never want to take any trading advice from me. Not that anything I ever say is an advice. So this is not, this is not financial advice, anyone, just in case you're wondering. Yeah, nothing, yeah. nothing is purely opinion, opinion based show. Yeah, right. um, so I don't know. Um, for me, it's just, Although more recently, I'm beginning to realize that there's a lot of sound money involved in Bitcoin, right? It's, it's kind of like, you know, the Dow dropped 800 and Bitcoin also moved a little bit. Interesting, right? And whereas everybody thought the original narrative was this is an uncorrelated asset. And Novo used to tell everybody, like, this is the only asset that can affect all your other assets, right? Maybe, maybe there's a lot more correlation than people realize because it's smart trading money that's at the top of the funnel. So, you know, Bitcoin, let's say the global financial crisis does happen, which I hope it doesn't, but, you know, the markets are saying it is, and we're seeing weird negative interest rates and stuff like that. Yep. Uh, it does, and you know, Bitcoin might, the general narrative around me uh, are saying that it might see like a halo pump. Some whale might just be like, ah, right? But then it, it'll follow the rest. That's sort of the mm -hmm. vibe I'm getting, right? So really, it's becoming clearly in like a correlated asset class, at least at this point in the market. Well, well, I mean, I, if you look at 2019, I've seen a lot of and I don't, you know, anyone who follows this channel knows I don't do a lot of technical analysis. Like I, I try to interpret and bring some popular TA to the channel. I have friends and, and more experts that I bring on the channel. Um, and they are, yeah, uh, like CZ, I bring on the channel all the time. No, I, I would love to have CZ on the channel. Um, but yeah, it's an art and, and it's tricky. And, you know, 
for the most part, it feels as though 2019 has shown a lot of uh, essentially Bitcoin just having these radical movements and then a lot of boring times. And it sort of feels as though there's a couple of really big hedge funds that are just starting to kind of play around with it. And uh, that it just feels like that's why it's almost as volatile as like some random altcoin right now, because you have money that is orders of magnitude bigger than earlier investors. And they're just sort of starting to kind of toe dip. And those toe dips are sending huge ripples uh, through the market in, in random directions. Um, what, what do you think is the narrative right now that would be the most healthy narrative? You said you're a Bitcoin rationalist, um, which I take to mean that you are not, not a maximalist, because that's a bad word, but somewhere in the Bitcoin rooted campus, <coughs> this is a, uh, where, where you want to be putting uh, most of your eggs. Well, no, I just, I just understand the significance of Bitcoin and just the history and, and, the, and the narrative behind Bitcoin, right? and why it's around. Uh, for me, I don't know, I, I try to take a more macro view in all of this. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I spent the last year and a half just like diving too deep into little nicks and Prunian details and a lot of those things don't really pan out much or they take a lot longer, mm -hmm. right? I, I'm looking at this from a much longer time horizon. And it's like, well, you know, what are the really significant things in crypto today that's proven out? And you know, what, what is the paradigm shift that we're not seeing? Like one of my friends, um, I don't know if you know Albi Chogari from Electro Capital, but literally one of the sharpest guys I know. Um, he, he used to be a partner at like Y Combinator and was at Facebook as a director before that. Phenomenal guy. And I look back to 2017 and like, what, what were people saying to me and who's right now, right? And he said, he said, you know, maybe this whole token thing is not going to work because it's a little too damn obvious. And I was like, break that down for me. And it's like, whenever something is a little bit too obvious, it just means it's a little wrong because entrepreneurs are like inherently just, you know, optimistic about the technology. Like mm -hmm. he was talking about Google Maps and Earth and geolocation. And I remember I fell for the same thing. When I was on the Google Maps team, I thought geospatial was the future. Like everybody got GPS in their phones. Are we going to be able to find everything? We're going to be able to mobilize. It's going to be amazing. self traffic cars. But then the real paradigm shift, the real breakthrough wasn't about you opening up a map and calling something going somewhere. It was about the driver finding you. It was about mm -hmm. Uber Eats finding you. That yep. created the $100 billion mobility industry that Google, for the most part, missed. That little tiny detail, right? It seems obvious, but it wasn't. And, you know, you can argue Google has the highest collection of IQ in the world, right? Probably. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, I don't know. For me, it's like, okay, let's see. There's an anonymous guy, whether he's alive or not, Satoshi, who's worth billions. Is he the first one? Yes. Is he the last one? Clearly not, right? There's companies like Binance, right, mm -hmm. who's built a multi-billion dollar unicorn, technically, you know, without really having a bank account. Like, that seems crazy to me. Right. That's that's amazing. I mean, it's yeah, you could also call it you also call it utterly insane. Um, it's, it's, insane. Yeah. it's utterly insane. And and then you also have, you know, the, the cultural impact of Binance, which now yeah. um, you see outrage. Uh, and I've I've sort of fought against this narrative because I think, you know, uh, I don't think any coin or project should need Binance to succeed. And I think that if people put Binance as say, oh, well, Binance uh, was being too tough on the listing fee. I'm like, well, you know, how many exchanges are there? You can't make the project work without Binance. And so um, I think there's sort of uh, people accuse throw the centralization logo on, on Binance. And to me, it's like, we need successful projects. We need projects that can um, achieve goals. And so I think, you know, personally, we should spend a little less time uh, tearing down projects in the space and a little more time uh, trying to uh, get more winners and get more people excited about crypto. Um, and so I don't know, I'm personally not that negative on Binance. I think that they've, you know, not every decision has been great, but I think it's absolutely amazing what they've achieved. I, you know, I think the way CZ handles himself on social media, I think the way he communicates and the transparency that they bring is actually pretty phenomenal. And, yeah. you know, I've spent material amounts of time with him here and there, and I've seen him change. This is my personal opinion. Like I've seen him change over the years. Right. And I, I think they've built one of the most important organizations in crypto today. And not because of the brand of power and the mind share that they have, but just the infrastructure that they've built. Like other people should or will follow this model, right? And this could be this really interesting step towards what, what it means to be a decentralized organization, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and and the word decentralization means a lot of different things for a lot of different people. Right. You know, like blockchain or decentralized. I don't know. There's P2P technology. There's a lot of other things, mm -hmm. right? That that'll play a part in, in bringing kind of decentralization or censorship resistance to the world, right? Uh, people just look at the little too obvious things, a little too short term, in my opinion. So, what kind of DApps do you think are right for the next stage? Of you know, we're here, DAPs. like you said, mindshare yeah. is is 
so short, but we know why did the iPhone become such a phenomenon? I think it was an interplay with the, the app store, right? And people were so enthralled with the new things they could do with the phone that they couldn't do uh, with any other phone. And so, you know, do dApps play a role in bringing adoption, right? You know, we have so many infrastructure plays. Where are the big uh, consumer-facing plays that are just fun? Yeah, so I don't know. I, I feel like um, at Web3, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like the world of Web3, all these folks are looking at Web3 from the lens of Web2, mm -hmm. right? You know, uh, you know, we use metrics that, that you know, might not be relevant. DAU, MAU, state time retention. Like we didn't, 10 years ago, we, no one talked about DAU, MAU, state time retention. That's, that's a very mobile first thing, right? And people feel like because mobile has such dominance that, you know, a DAP or a service should be active on the app store or stuff like that. It might not even be, it literally could take 10 years, right? And that might not even be a word, you know? Mm -hmm. Like Kakao's going around saying BAP, blockchain as an application. It's like, okay, those are different. So, so again, these terminologies are kind of like forcing us into a box, yep. right? Fair yeah, enough. I think, I don't know, like right now, like DeFi stuff looks kind of interesting. I'm personally not a big, I don't think it's not, I think it'll take a long, long, long time, right? Um, I think all these gaming stuff is really cool, primarily because if they can figure out a way to get regular people who don't get crypto to try new things, that's really important to me, right? Yeah, so, I'm, I'm yeah, very passionate I, I see a lot about of that the gaming thing. Yeah. I'm yeah. very passionate about the game thing. As we've discussed, uh, the ch people who follow my channel know I'm building a game and uh, yeah. I just see it as uh, a, a simple way to get people interacting with the ecosystem. And, and there's so much learning to actually understand what a blockchain is and why it's significant. We don't want to make people go through that. People don't like to be forced to learn a lot of stuff. Um, and so, you know, what games do is they teach you things in, in, a, in a way that's fun. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I think, I think games definitely have a, have a big role to play. Um, what do you think is just, what do you want to leave the audience with? You know, you have a lot of crypto investors, people who are speculating on the market who watch this content. What do you want to leave them with? What kind of advice? What have you learned? You've been a lot of, a lot of your own dollars have been put in this market. You've seen good things and bad things. Um, and, you know, the last quarter of 2019, how would you like to uh, educate the audience on, on what you're thinking, what they should be looking for? Hmm. There's, I, I still think there's a lot of noise in crypto land today. There's a lot of like reporters and news articles that are just surface level, right? Um, if you're really excited about the space, you know, go go meet some people, go to a meetup. There's still a very real um, communal communal kind of movement here that's really important and it's still accessible. I think people people don't realize how early we are in the space. Like you can literally go to a conference and see Vitalik and CZ, like right there. Right. I remember that was the shocking thing for me. Um, like the very first conference I went to, I was in Shanghai and I was in a circle of friends and I was like learning about crypto. I didn't know very much about it. I was like just trying to meet people. And Vitaly comes into my circle and was like, hi guys, do you know me? And we're like, what? Selfie time, selfies, right? So it's still, it's still reachable, right? And instead of sitting around and just speculating all day, looking at charts, like go, go, go figure out for yourself. You know, one of, one of my uh, prolific investor friends in the Bay Area told me this thing that he does as an investor, right? He, before investing in any company, he just shows up at their office and says, hey, you can, can I work here for half an hour? Right? And he sits there and just watches how the team operates. And that's more than enough to tell him if this is worth investing or not. So everybody's got their kind of like secret formula. Yep. So because I'm not a technical trader, right? Because I still think there's a lot of random speculation, manipulation going on in crypto land today. If this is a category that you're interested in, you're passionate about, just, you know, get, get out there. Like, go, go meet some people. If there's an event in town, go meet them, right? Go listen, right? Uh, I, think, I, think, I think it's a lot more reachable than people realize. Um, and also, uh, like, my risk tolerance is insanely high, and I don't think anybody should be doing what I'm doing, to be honest. So yep. only, only really invest uh, what, what you can afford to lose, because there's a very real chance that this thing can go to zero. I still believe that. Right, like one of my friends is telling me this as well. Like, you know, what, what could end Bitcoin? Like, there's a there's tons of examples in history of complex software having one bug that ends the whole thing instantly, right? Literally, right? So there's a very real chance, and, and you got to be realistic about that. Yeah, I think that's extremely sage words. You know, the risk it, there wouldn't be this opportunity if there wasn't tremendous, tremendous risk involved. 
Um, mm -hmm. You know, if if you think it's uh, just simple to throw in one dollar and make it a hundred dollars, uh, it comes with the very real chance of that dollar going uh, going completely goodbye. So yeah, just understand that that risk is what creates the opportunity. You can't have one without the other, and that of course be careful. Um, again, the community aspect so so true. I'm going to look into doing a little bit more of a, a meetup scene. Uh, locally around here in Los Angeles. And so I think that's that's a very wise uh, thing to educate yourself, invest in yourself, as Andreas Antonopoulos would say. Uh, as usual, mm -hmm. I really appreciate your time, Alex. I know you're a very busy guy, but you have a very unique perspective on this market. And I want to thank you for sharing that with the FUD TV audience. So thanks so much for your time. No, man, thank you for having me. This has been great. Awesome. Thanks. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I know I certainly did. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment in the comment section below. Let us know what about this conversation you enjoyed. Ask any questions or react in the comment section below, of course. And be sure to like this video. As usual, my name's Elio Trades. You're watching FUD TV. And I'll see you very, very soon on the next episode.